Hey everyone, welcome to this video on preparing machine images for QMU slash KVM. This is actually an extension from a previous post that I had done not too long ago about Linux hypervisor setup using the libvirt QMU KVM stack. Now, if you're not too familiar with the stack, I recommend you stop now, watch this video, or read my blog post. I'll have the link in the description of this video. But we talked a bit about how it's a really robust, minimal, capable system for running virtual machines. And after posting this video, there's a really good comment that came up from this user, Lamka02SK, saying, do you know by chance how you can have multiple VMs accessible over LAN? If I clone multiple VMs, they have the same IP address, so I can only access one through SSH. They can change them manually, but would like to know if it could be automated. This is a great question. I think it's one that oftentimes causes us some pain when we're first learning about machine images. This is why I wanted to do a video about preparing machine images for QMU slash KVM. Now, what exactly are we getting at here? I think it's kind of, there's kind of two phases to it. So in the previous post, we went through and we set up all the different components for libvirt, QMU, KVM, and we installed a or multiple Ubuntu VMs. So in this post, quite similar. And I'm gonna have all these steps documented on my website. If you wanna check that out, check the description of this video. But needless to say, we talked a bit about how you can download an ISO and then run it. So let's, let's start with just that to kind of frame this problem here. So I have the command in this post as well. That is the command line version of installing this. I've also put this in my machine here. So if we look at it, we run a command called vert install. We set up the name for the domain inside of libvert. We give it some RAM, we give it some CPU, but we also specify the path that the image will live at along with the ISO we downloaded for Ubuntu. And this is nothing unique to to what we talked about last time. We'll go ahead and run the vert sh script, which in this case will open up a utility called vert viewer. So basically it's set up a VNC connection to allow me to start the installation of this specific, of this specific virtual machine. So I'll just make that a little bit bigger. Okay, we'll go to English down here, install the server. All right, and we'll go ahead and let this get bootstrapped now. And I'm just gonna kind of start this installation off. So as we talk more about this idea of preparing images and how to solve for unique IPs and all that good stuff, we, we at least have a base to, to kind of start off with here. So once this is up and running, we should get the normal Ubuntu graphical installation. We'll give it just another second here. And there it is. All right, so we're gonna just blast right through this. Um, you can pause the video or go see my other one for more details, but we choose the language, we continue, we keep going through. Now it does mention that it's gonna give us an IP address and it says 122.17 is what it will give us. So let's try to remember that for now. It'll be a little bit relevant later. We'll hit done, no proxy, default mirror, use the entire disk, let me get out of that. Okay, we will do the operation of rewriting. And then I'm just gonna put in the information. Now the host name is gonna be U20, so that's what I'm putting in here. My username will be my name, and then I'll go ahead and put in a password. I'll also install OpenSSH server because while this VNC works okay, I'll be doing most of the configuration through SSH. And while we're talking more, we'll go ahead and let this initial installation of Ubuntu start. So. Let's talk a little bit more about how we're going to prepare this image, and it kind of comes down to two things. The first thing is, once Linux is installed, I might want to go out and clone instances and instances and instances of this uh, kind of base image, if you will. And this was, I think, what the question was really getting at. Now, let's assume, and in this example, I'll be kind of pulling through an example of needing to set up hosts to eventually run Kubernetes clusters. So in that case, I'll typically need a container runtime, I'll need a Kubernetes agent called a kubelet, and I might even need to do some configuration, like in Kubernetes, you have to have the swap space disabled. Now, if you're not a Kubernetes user and couldn't care less about it, think of these things as some package that you care about installing. Maybe it's some system utilities or application monitoring agents or whatever it might be. There's just there's some things you want to install and you want them available at every instance of your virtual machine. 
And then, and this kind of hits closer to where the question was rooted, there's questions about how do we clean up that base image to ensure when we clone it, things we don't want are, are, are uh, not persisted. So as an example, this is where the IP address was coming in. How do we do the DHCP lease? In other words, how do we make sure that if one virtual machine got an IP address from DHCP, when we clone it, the next VM doesn't get the same IP. Then they'll overlap, you won't be able to SSH in, all that bad stuff will happen. Additionally, what about the host name? If we name one of our hosts dog, there's a pretty good chance that when we clone it, we won't want all of our instances to be named dog. So in our case with U20, you know, how do we make sure that not every single host is U20? All right. So that's exactly what we're going to solve today. And we're going to do it in talking a little bit about image setup. So all of the things we'll do today are going to be completely manual because if you're tinkering, manual is fine. And frankly, you know, it's a great learning tool to kind of go step by step and learn how these pieces work. In, you know, more serious scenarios like production type uh, environments, you're of course going to automate all the things that we're talking about. You might automate it through tools like Ansible and then print out machine images from there. There's a bunch of ways to do it. But in this case, we're going to do it all manual. And maybe I'll do a post in the future about how to kind of automate this whole process. If it, if it interests you, let me know in the comments. Now, we've got the operating system installing. And we've run the vert install command, which is now going through the Ubuntu install. And hopefully Ubuntu is setting itself up. So right now it looks like the OS has actually installed and it's just going through and doing some security updates. So that's perfect. Now let's actually take a quick look at the DHCP leases that libvert knows about or, or Versh can tell us about. Now I'm using the default network through libvert. If you're not, like you're using a bridge network or relying on an external DHCP server, this command might not give you any details if that's the case. You might have to go you know, to, if in the case if I had my, my router giving me the DHCP leases, I might have to look there or just look through some different mechanism. But this is a really cool output if we're doing it all through through libvert. So let's take a quick look here. We'll go over to this bash window. We'll do that and we can actually see two instances. So before this video recording, I was testing some stuff out and this is actually a lease from a, an original install, 2294. Now you'll notice that host name is the same as the host name right below it, which is our current install. This is the 12217 we saw before. Now, the reason I point this out is it'll become relevant later when we learn about how to ensure unique IP addresses. The key things here are this IP address was given to this client ID. And what we need to make sure is when we clone, the replicas don't inherit the same client ID because if they do, they may end up with the same IP address, which is where you get those overlapping issues and inabilities to network correctly. So we'll go back to view, vert viewer here. It looks like it's getting pretty darn close. So let's just set ourselves up for a quick SSH session here. We will clear out, we will SSH. I'll put in my name. And what we're gonna do once this install is complete is I will SSH into the server. And then what I've done is I've taken all the common steps that I would need to do. Again, normally you'd automate this through a more elegant tool like Ansible, but I just wrote a quick bash script that does the common things. It upgrades the system. It installs all of the container runtime bits. So in this case, container D with, with Docker on top, and it's gonna do some configuration of that container runtime. And then lastly, specific to Kubernetes, I install the kubelet, which is the kube agent, the bootstrapping tool, kube admin, and then kubectl, the command line utility. And one interesting thing here too is I'm using apt, which is the package manager, aptitude, to mark the kubelet, kubeadm, and kubectl as a hold, which basically means if I do a future system upgrade, I don't want these three utilities to upgrade without me intervening. Since these are really core to the version of kube I'm running and so on, I wanna keep these static. So I'll go ahead and copy all of this. And this will automate some of our initial install on, on, on our future, future base image here. We'll go back to Vert Viewer. It looks like it has set itself up. So I'm going to go ahead and hit the reboot button that it has mentioned. And it will restart itself. Now, it did open another Vert Viewer window. But now we should be good to close out of the VNC and just do everything going forward through the command line. So we'll go ahead and SSH in. I'll say yes, put in my password. 
And then this install script will be done exclusively as sudo. And I will go ahead and put in the install sh. We will go ahead and make that executable as well. So install.sh looks pretty good. Uh, we'll do a set paste and let's go ahead and paste in all of that. So again, this is arbitrary packages. This could be something totally different depending on what you care about. But for now, we'll just go ahead and run this install script. And this will basically set up our base system for us. So while that's installing, updating, and all that good stuff, we'll talk just a little bit about uh, the, the swap space bit that we're, we're going to do next with this system. So this is, again, something specific to Kubernetes. But in the Ubuntu installer, I'm not really sure how to disable swap space. I'm sure there's some way to do it. So what happened inside of the virtual machine is that inside of Etsy file system table or FSTAB, sounds much cooler, right? Uh, there is going to be a line for setting up the swap space. And basically, I'm just going to uh, comment this out or, uh, or delete the line, frankly. And that will ensure that I persist in, in effect that the swap space will not be there. So in fact, while this is installing, what we could do super easily, let's just grab that uh, that lease one more time. So this was, it was actually the, the 17 one, I think, right? And you can actually, actually you can see the host name now that it uh, restarted my, uh, my human is in the way down here. <laughs> the U20 uh, is now the host name associated with this IP because it restarted with the host name being instantiated. So we'll go ahead and SSH in Josh at here and we will put in our password. So while that's installing up there, we'll go in and edit the Etsy fstab folder, or file, I should say. And then at the very bottom here, you can see the swap space. So we wanna take the swap space and again, either delete it, or in this case, just for reference, I'll go ahead and comment it out, disabled swap. All right, and then we'll save that up. And now we should be pretty good on swap space. So we have installed Ubuntu. We have run a script or are running a script to install all the packages that I care about for my clones. And I have disabled the FSTAB. So we should be looking pretty good overall. I think the top has just finished up. So you can see that it has uh, put kubelet, kubeadmin, and kubectl on hold. And now we're looking pretty good. Now, we've done the image setup. I would say at this point, we've got a pretty good base image, at least as far as Kubernetes is concerned. But we need to talk about prepping it to actually be a base image. Now, what does that mean? So we're going to focus on the host name, and we're also going to focus on the IP address piece that we talked about earlier. The IP address piece is super interesting. If you've ever run into this, you might find how this works to be to be really intriguing. So basically what happens is your Linux host is going to have some type of DHCP client. There's tools like DH client on desktop Linux boxes. Oftentimes folks use this thing called network manager, which can use DH client or use its own DHCP client. But on a lot of servers, we use systemd networkd. Now, what's interesting about systemd networkd is inside of run systemd net if I'm trying to remember leases two, okay, there is a file that get, that gets written here under run um, that basically has all the details about the DHCP request. So this actually tells me some of the key things. Where did we go out to get the IP address? What IP address were we given? What client ID did we provide? So if you recall, this ID ending in 84 is the same ID if we do that net DHCP uh, watch again. That's the same ending here, 9AD4, that we see. So this is kind of correlating from the DHCP server standpoint. This is on my host to the Ubuntu box, which is right here which is, uh, again, kind of the client perspective. Now, the question here is, how does this client ID get generated? And how do we ensure that clones do not take on the same client ID? So to do this, we need to figure out where it comes from. Now, what's interesting about this is by default in systems like Ubuntu and some other ones as well, this actually gets generated from this file. 
Now, the values are a bit different here, but make no mistake, this is in fact what is going to be used to generate this DUID or client ID. So what's important for us to do here is to ensure that we understand where this value comes from and how we can ensure it is unique for every new clone that we use. Now, I'll pause here and just let you know, and if you do some researching, you'll find this, that many people will go in and they'll configure their host to use the MAC address of their interface as the client ID. So if I do IP A, I can look at my ethernet device here on the VM and you can see the MAC address right here. Now, if I went in, in the case of Ubuntu, I can go into this thing called NetPlan and say, use MAC address as the DHCP client ID. That's fine, that technically works. But it's kind of good practice to make sure that this machine ID is in fact flushed and appropriate to the machine. And in effect, we can also solve the DHCP issue by doing that. So let's take a quick look at how exactly this machine ID works. So we know that machine ID is set on this host. Now, there's actually a utility that uh, is called systemd machine ID setup, a little C program that when you run it, it seems like it does nothing, right? And it actually isn't doing anything. If we were to go ahead and just cl uh, clear out this file for a moment, so we're gonna do echo n, and we will clear out Etsy machine ID. Now, if we run the systemd machine ID setup, you'll notice it outputs something differently. It says initializing machine ID from KVM UUID. So this is rather curious, right? Basically, what's happening here is the, the, uh, the machine ID is figuring out whether that value is empty and needs to be set. If it does need to be set, what it goes ahead and does is it realizes that it's running virtualized in KVM, and it actually pulls the value from sys class DMI ID product UUID. This is the same value as what we have up here in machine ID. Now, what it's getting this from is basically the KVM UUID for each domain that gets stood up. If I open up a bottom buffer here and we look on my host for a moment using Versh, we can ask for the domain UUID for U20. And there is the exact same value. So this is where it's pulling it from. Now, the good news is, every KVM instance is going to have, or every machine ID is going to have its own unique UUID. But as we learned up in the top here, if this file is not empty, it will not rewrite what is inside of there. And thus, you'll end up with the same client ID in effect, the same IP address as well. Pretty interesting stuff. And if you're interested in kind of the gory details here, on my website, I have the snippet from the system D C code that describes this process. You can actually read it pretty easily, showing that if it's empty, it goes in and it will check to see if it's in a container. If not, it'll check to see if it's in a KVM. And if it's in a KVM, you can actually see where it reads from that specific UUID. So I've got that in my site and a link to the, uh, the source on GitHub as well if you wanna check that out. Nonetheless, this is a long way of saying that if we flush this file before we, uh, before we uh, restart and start, or not restart, but stop and start using this as a base, we're gonna be good to go. So in effect, what we need to do is we need to run the echo command that I did before, get rid of that, and then just make sure that machine ID is in fact empty. And now we can be sure that it will start back up with a new IP on all the clones. So at this point, the IP address is taken care of. But another concern that I had mentioned, which is conceptually simpler, but a little bit more involved, is that there is a host name set. And in Linux, we set this in the Etsy host name file. Now, how you do your host name is really up to you. I, in the past, I've mimicked my IP address and wrote a little script that always writ, wrote the IP address. I've actually come to prefer setting a random alpha-based or alphanumeric uh, short 
sequence of characters to represent my host name. And what I prefer to do is when a new machine turns on, the host name gets written and then it's never altered for the rest of the life of that virtual machine. That's just kind of the flow that I like. And I like it to be completely random, doesn't have to be crazy or fancy or configurable. So how do I do this? Well, what I start by doing is I set up a little script inside of user local bin that I call host name init.shell and I'll make sure that this is executable too so I don't forget so we'll do a plus x here for host I guess I need to do the full path again right user local bin host name init.shell all right now on my site I have this script in here if you would like to copy and paste it or try it for yourself but let's copy it over and I'll explain what it's got going on it's nothing nothing revolutionary it's pretty pretty mundane so i set this variable to the name of the script because i use it in log messages to be able to quickly find it inside of journal ctl the first thing i do is i check to see if etsy hostname file exists if it does exist i do literally nothing at all i exit immediately i don't assume that the thing calling the script will check to see if the file exists i always check it in the script then if it doesn't exist, I go ahead and set the host name. Now you can go and Google what each of these pieces do, but suffice to say, it prints out way too much data. <laughs> it grabs three characters, A through Z, and it basically writes the host name from there, which it then puts in the host name file. So it's totally kind of ridiculous, but it does the job really well. So it sets the host name. I log a message saying that that's there. And then the one thing that I don't love about this script, and there's probably a much better way to do it, you know, if you can think of a way, let me know in the comments. But once I'm done, if the hostname file then exists, which ideally it should unless it failed, I run a reboot. And the reason I run a reboot is when it goes and turns back on, I like to be sure that when it goes and grabs the DH, the address of the DHCP server, it goes in with the host name being set, which means that it fills in here. I've played around with like different run levels and system D to try to get it to set the host name early enough. I never could make that work, even when I put it before all the networking stuff. So I don't know what the deal is. This works really well. It's certainly dangerous because if something went wrong here, in theory, I could end up in a reboot loop. But this is experimentation. This is home lab stuff. It, it Overall, it works totally fine. So let's go ahead and save that up. We've now got that uh, as an executable file. And since hostname does exist, just as a quick sanity check, I should be able to run hostname init and you can see that it will tell me that it exists and it's a no op. Now, I'm not gonna delete hostname and run it right now because it would restart the server, which would again, redo my machine ID stuff. That's, that's kind of an important thing. Once we get the base image all cleaned up and good to go, it's important to note that if we were to start this server again, removing the hostname file, cleaning out the machine ID, we'd have to do all that again because on boot up, it will, even in the base image, it will write the, that stuff again. So, you know, this is something we're kind of trying to set up and then kind of lock down the, the base image and only use it as a, as a cloned thing. So the next thing I need to do to make sure that this can work is set up a systemd unit. Uh, so systemd is an init system. Um, it is uh, on most modern Linux distros. People have opinions about it. That's neat. But overall, it's there and, and we've learned to live with it. So if we do etsy systemd system hostname dash init dot service, this will be my uh, unit file, if you will. And inside of this unit file, I'm going to paste in some stuff and it's pretty self-explanatory. I've got a description for the unit. Um, I do also check to see if Etsy hostname exists here. While this is redundant because the script checks this, I don't like the idea of the script having to understand about things outside of it, having to understand like, oh, is someone else going to check this for me? I like them to all kind of only know about themselves. This enables me to do it. And frankly, two checks is just you know sometimes better than one so it works well we call the host name init script and then we call the multi-user target uh, as well for the install directive now i won't get too much into the multi-user target this has stuff to do if you're familiar with like sys5 init with like the uh init levels um i think this covers like three through five or something but it's neither here nor there. Um, you can check out the systemd docs to understand this. The most important part is really the exact start in the condition path exists. So if we save this file up, we'll make sure that it has the right privileges it needs. 
um, Etsy system D here, I'll just copy this over so I don't fat finger it here we'll copy this over okay great we've got the permission set up now the last thing I need to do to make system D work well is I just need to say that I want to do system CTL and I want to enable hostname init service. And this makes some sim links a very fancy way of saying that now when the system turns on, this init unit is going to fire off, which in effect should hit the init script. So the very last step here, if all goes well, is to ensure that this thing can actually run and be successful, I need to delete Etsy uh, the Etsy host name. So kind of as a quick sanity check, here's an example. So if we do system CTL start host name init service, okay? And then we do system CTL status host name init service, you'll notice that condition failed. That's exactly what we wanted. So the script didn't even get touched because the condition failed, nothing needed to occur. That's exactly what we want. So what we'll do here is we'll run the removal of the Etsy hostname file. Now again, I'm not gonna start the systemd unit or run the script because it will trigger a restart on this host, but now we can see I no longer have a Etsy hostname file, which means it should be generated on startup. And now we've set this up as a pretty good base image to start cloning. Now, you might have some more stuff you wanna clean up, right? You may say, oh, you know, I really you know, let's look in here. I really don't like the install script sitting around, totally reasonable. Perhaps you look around and notice that there is a bash history of all, or maybe is it a bash history? Huh, maybe there isn't a bash history on this host. Um, well, if there was a, a bash history of sorts, then perhaps you'd want to go in and actually delete that bash history because you don't want all your commands stored in a file and you know so on and so forth. But basically, sky's the limit. We can clean up whatever we want to. And once we feel good and I feel good about this now, uh, we can go ahead and um, we can go ahead and basically power it off. Now, I, I guess as kind of a final step in this video, I'll spin up a Kubernetes cluster on the VMs just because it's kind of the point. So uh, one of the things I'll do to include in this base image is I'll run kubeadm config images pool. And what this command is going to do is it's actually going to pull down the Kubernetes components. They come in as, as Docker images, or not Docker images, container images. Uh, and just preloading them here and having them in the base image will enable me to start all my other machines quicker. So this is just you know one extra step I'm doing here for, uh, for extra credit, if you will. All right, looks pretty good. Let's make sure Etsy hostname is gone as a sanity check, great. And then to make sure DHCP works, we'll just check Etsy machine ID one more time, looks great. Let's go ahead and power off this host now. And now we have got a base image. So I'm back on my machine. If I do verse list all, I'm now considering U20 to be my base image. And we are now ready to start cloning these images and see if we can get these working. So. To reiterate one more time, if I start U20 in the future, I will have to do my cleanup steps again. Unless I, you know, I, maybe it's best to like quarantine this off and make sure I never mistake it for a VM. Uh, but again, I'm going to keep this off. I'm only going to clone from it going forward. To clone from it is pretty simple as well. There is on the website a quick command that you can run using a utility that we covered in the last video, which is vert clone. So if we go over here and we'll see if I have a clone SH already set up, I do, perfect. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna run vert clone where the original is U20. We're gonna name one of the nodes CP0 or control plane zero. So in Kubernetes, there's control plane nodes and worker nodes. Uh, the file is going to be stored in CP0. And then for uh, worker zero, we'll do the same command. We'll do worker zero and we'll set it in the file W0. So let's go ahead and run clone sh. So this is not going to start the virtual machines. It is only going to clone the images. I can still start them as a separate process. And what's great here is we'll be able to watch this uh, this uh, verse net DHCP list as the hosts come up. The ideal state here is they're going to start up, and initially they won't have a host name, right? Because when they first start, the host name script's going to run all that jazz. But then they should restart, and we should actually see the host name show up. And again, we should see each new VM has its own 
unique IP address because that that machine ID was empty. Thus, we expect the systemd uh, you know machine ID setup command to run and to gather the UUID unique to the KVM. So these have now been created. Let's go ahead and do a quick verse list all, and then we'll start them up. So we'll do a verse start for CP0. We'll do the same thing for M0, if I type it correctly, that is. Okay. And, oh, not M0, CP0 and W0 is what I should have said. And now we'll come back here and we can see them starting already. So here's our first machine. You can see it's missing a host name, but this is 104. So it's likely that 104 is my control plane. And just like that, it's, it's really that fast. It set up its host name and restarted. It called itself Beth or Beef. Uh, and then the second node started, TXB. It's got a unique IP address. Just like that, we have instantiated two good to go machine images, ready to run Kubernetes, done deal. This, this is what's so cool about this tool set is it's just so simple to put the pieces together. So now we can grab 104 and 15 as an example. I can, uh, I'll open up a third buffer here. All right, so we'll do an SSH and up here we'll do 104. Yep. Okay, so now we're at 104, and then we'll go back and let's go ahead and grab 15 as well, or TXB. So we'll SSH into that, so SSH. Okay, and we'll do this IP right here. We'll do yes, we'll do that. Now check this out. If we go into BEF and we do a quick sudo, all right, so we'll do that and we will, not cube cuddle, getting a step ahead of myself. We'll do journal CTL for the unit uh, host name service and check this out. You can see where it called itself or it got called and it said host name, host name BEF created, set a random host name, so on and so forth, resulted in the host name. And uh, in, in, the, in the reboot, you can see where after the host name was set, the condition check resulted in it not needing to set the host name, so it did nothing. It's exactly what we want. So this will be called BEF until I either delete the Etsy host name or uh, this virtual machine is no longer, just like that. So I'll go into sudo for both of them here. All right. And then for Kubernetes, we can run a command uh, called kubeadm init. This will actually initialize a Kubernetes cluster. So this top one, like I had mentioned, is going to be my control plane cluster. And then this bottom one here is going to be one of my worker nodes. So piece of cake to set this up. And this isn't like Kubernetes running in containers on containers. These are real virtual machines, you know, completely configurable. I've got full control of them. I can then grab the join command right here from the init. I can throw that down here. Okay. And the swap space is turned off and all that good stuff. Otherwise it would yell at me. And if we grab this output here and exit out, so these are all Kubernetes specific things at this point, but if we do kubectl uh, get nodes, watch kubectl get nodes, here we can see our two host names are set up just like that. We've got BEF, we've got TXB. BEF is the master, TXB is the, uh, is the worker node, and likely the only thing that's holding it back from being ready is that there is no, uh, there is no CNI or networking installed. So yep, this is a perfectly healthy cluster, scheduler, controller manager, API server all turning on, and all this stuff will go to ready, the core DNS bits especially, if a container networking plugin was set up, which just would mean me applying a YAML file and then boom, I've got a working Kubernetes cluster just like that. So pretty freaking cool. I, I, hope, you, I hope you found this video interesting. Um, like I had said, I, I think this really is kind of a natural extension of, of sort of what we had talked about last time, which was setting up the whole libvert stack. And now we've taken that a step further and basically set ourselves up to create base images for cube clusters. And if your use case is different, you're just gonna install different packages. But now you understand the cleanup mechanics, you understand where that DHCP ID comes from and all that good stuff. So if you like this video, I'd love to hear from you. Shoot a comment. If you've got ideas for new videos, this video came from the idea of a commenter. Um, give me a comment, give me a like, let me know what you think, good or bad. And with that said, I will see you next time. Thanks again for watching. Later all.